a bit disappointing that we don't have more people at this uh, plenary. But then, on the other hand, the ones who are here are obviously very committed. So we will have quality rather than quantity focus on this. So a very warm welcome. A very warm welcome to this plenary on changing mindsets, India's missing women. I draw your attention to the subheading of the World Economic Forum, says committed to improving the state of the world. And I believe, as I'm sure the panelists do and you do, that we cannot improve the state of the world if we do not talk about 50% of the population of this world. And I must congratulate the World Economic Forum for bringing this topic as a plenary in this session. I think this is tremendously important and I look forward to the next uh, hour and quarter on this discussion. Uh, of course, this term, missing women, was originally coined by Professor Amartya Sen when he talked about the issue of a distorted sex ratio in India. But over time, the concept of missing women must not be taken just to mean prenatal uh, infanticide. It is actually much more serious than that. It's basically excess female mortality through the entire life cycle. Of course, at birth or before birth, at birth, at the age of five, and then during the reproductive years. Women are systematically discriminated against to the extent that their lives are taken. Let's not mince words. We're talking about mortality here. And what we have, therefore, to do is recognize that this excess female mortality in the world at large, unfortunately, 87% of this global excess female mortality comes from India, China, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Not the poorer countries of the parts of the world. Actually, I'm sure my panel members will agree that it has got nothing to do with income. India, unfortunately, does not do well at all on the score of what is called the global statistics of gender, uh, uh, gender gap report. For example, the World Economic Forum released a report just recently which ranks India 105th among 135 countries and is actually the lowest ranking among the BRICS countries. Uh, last census, 2011, India has a sex ratio of 940, whereas the global average is close to 984. So we obviously have a problem. We have a very serious problem. And I couldn't think of a better set of panelists than World Economic Forum has assembled here. So let me introduce them uh, in no particular order. Uh, Krishna Thirath, Minister of State for Ministry of, at the Ministry of Women and Child Development. Uh, Anuradha Koirala, a founder, Maithi Nepal. Rajendra Singh Pawar, Chairman of NIIT Group of India. Chavi Rajavath, she is a Sarpanch of Soda. She is many other things too, but I'm most interested in having her here as a Sarpanch of a Village Council of Soda. Malika Sarabhai, Director Darpana Academy of Performing Arts, and as you will find, a very, very committed, passionate advocate of the issues at hand. And Jasmine Whitbread, she is the Chief Executive Officer of Save the Children International UK. So with this panel, my challenge will be just to keep them to a time limit, because I know they've got a lot of things to say, interesting things to say. And I'll start off by going first to Minister Thirath, and basically ask you, madam, that India, in spite of the grim statistics I've talked about, is not wanting for legislation. The legislations are there, but in spite of that, we have what we have, which is a pretty grim situation. So, madam minister, may I ask you, what's your thought on Legislation part of the solution, implementation, where do we stand? More importantly, where do you see it going? Thank Adam. you, Mr. Nag. I know it's a burning issue today, and not in India even, uh, as globally. Uh, this problem as constitution gives equal right to men and women. Even then, the women are missing in India. Much as you said, uh, 940 out of 1,000, the sex ratio. 
Now, this problem is largely due to sun preference. Because in our society, everybody wants son, not a daughter. If they want single a child, then a son. Sun preference is done due to several factors such as um, deep root deep-rooted social and cultural norms. For example, sons are supposed to carry family name, take care of their parents in old age, light the funeral pyre, etc., etc. These are the problem that family needs son. And however, now the technology, now it is possible to know this child sex by ultrasound. It is one side, it is good, for the other disease, but uh, the other side is not good. Because of the sex selection is possible today, which was possible earlier, hence number of girl child is getting less and we are facing the problem of declining child sex ratio. So to, uh, how to fight with this? We have some legislation, you uh, told me that you, everybody knows about legislation, but I would like to say something on the legislation. These are the legislation, we brought out several legislation to prevent this problem, um, non-missing uh, women. Our constitution provides equal, be equality between men and women. My ministry brought several legislation on the protection of women, empowerment of women, such as Dowry Prohibition Act, Provision, uh, Prevention of Domestic Violence Act, Prevention of Immoral Trafficking Act, and Provision of Child Marriage Act. We also have the preconception and prenatal diagnosis techni technique, etc. PCPAT Act. We are introducing amendment further strengthen these acts and hold consultation of the civil society organization from time to time. Presently, held constitution with women MPs. We have already discussed with the women MP how to solve this problem, the child decline. So, uh, strengthening dowry provision act also. My ministry has early recently enacted the Protection of Child from Sexual Offence Bill, from Sexual Offence Act 2012. Even then, the problem is there. I think um, my ministry, there are only legislation cannot be a solution. If we made uh, this legislation and we say that this problem will be solved, no, it will not be solved. But real solution is empowering women and improving the status of women in the society. For this, our efforts are multi-pronged in ensure political, social, and economic empowerment of women. Recently, we, um, NMEW, National Empowerment of Women, we have already uh, created this session. The education and awareness plays a very important role. We have introduced schemes like SABLA, IGMSI, SABLA, uh, Rajiv Gandhi Empowerment Adolescent Girls. We are giving training, uh, training in this Sabla scheme, slave, uh, giving training to women, child, girl, child, 11 to 18 years old. The National Mission for Empowerment of Women to improve the status of girl, child, and women. Sabla is scheme of empowering of adolescent girls through life skill education so that they can be the agent of change in the society. We can say Ahinsa Messenger. And we have already uh, created some Islam messenger at Pali in Rajasthan, Kamrup um, in Assam, and 320, 20 Ahinsa messengers. So they can, they can aware, they can give awareness to the uh, people. So these are the things. So we can, we can improve the Thank you. girl child. Thank you, Madam Minister. Uh, you're right. I mean, you know, you need uh, legislation, but you also need empowerment. But I'll come back to you in a moment uh, on enforcement. What are you doing to enforce the legislation that you have? You have some very good legislation on the books, but what are you doing about those who violate it? But I'll come back to you. Through awareness. Through awareness. But I'll come back to you, Madam Minister, and I'll push you a bit on that. But first, if I may go to Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine, you, of course, have a very broad international perspective. So could you share with us some of the international regional experiences with some reference to the issues that Madam Minister herself has raised. Yes. Sure, yes. I mean, I think for India, this very low value placed on the lives of girls and women has got to be really the key issue that India faces. And when uh, countries face big 
attitude and belief type issues like that that, that need to be shifted. Um, my experience is looking around the world, and actually in the history of India as well, um, we can see that multi-level national sustained campaigns can shift mindsets. So um, whether you're thinking about civil rights movements or the breaking down of gender or other discrimination issues, um, more recently, the uh, whole taboo that's been broken around very successfully in some countries around HIV and AIDS. Um, but what's needed is a campaign that targets action at many levels of society. And I think the danger is here in India it would be the search for a silver bullet or some quick wins. Th this has got to be something that really government together with civil society and business leaders all come together to, to make that campaign work. And that would really need the back, backing of, of a, a sustained media campaign with, with public figures getting involved. I mean, we've seen in, in South Africa the, the role that, that um, soap operas can play in terms of, in, in, in that case, around HIV and AIDS. And I know there's great examples here in India as well. But also public figures, celebrities and public figures coming out and talking about these issues and being prepared to, to break the taboo and to, to really start to, to create an environment of change. Um, as well as that, there will need to be policy steps taken sort of at all levels really, whether it's at school or in the, at the community level um, or, or in business, and I think perhaps we'll come back to that. But picking up on this issue of, of legislation that you talk about, I think um, the key issue there is, as, as you were pushing, around actually making the legal and justice system work for girls and women. F families and communities have got to really believe that, um, you know, if they need to go to the police, that, that the action will be taken. A great example of this, I think, here in India is in the state of Kerala, where uh, a, a whole sort of network of police stations has been set up that are designed to be friendly to women and to, to girls and women making, um, wanting to bring uh, uh, complaints to the police where typically across the, the country they, they're very fearful of doing that because they don't have any sense that, that they're going to be supported and protected when they, when they do come forth with those complaints. So there are examples here in India as well as from around the world of, of how to tackle this. Thanks, Jasmine. Thanks very much. You have really touched on a dimension which is very important for us at this session, and that is basically challenging the conspiracy of silence. People would rather not talk about it because of the stigma. And you mentioned Kerala, and we have somebody here who I know has actually worked on it. So, Malik, I would like you to take it on from there, but also talk a bit about the use of media, use of entertainment to actually push forward this agenda and breaking this conspiracy of silence. Malika. I'm glad that Jasmine has mentioned the Kerala episode. Uh, I am partially Malayali and I started going to the state very frequently about five years ago. And having been brought up on the myth of a matriarchal, matrilineal state, I was absolutely horrified at the repression of girls in Kerala. I was talking to a bunch of girls and they were talking of how they get molested on the bus. And I said, were you the only woman? And she said, no, we were about 20 of us. So I said, why didn't you shout? And she said, because had I shouted, the other 19 women would have turned away. And they would have said, just shut up and suffer. Because it is shameful to bring this upon yourself, and you are the one who are shamed. So I started working with the Kerala State Women's Development Corporation, and we developed a film uh, based on case studies, fictionalized. And I took it to 40,000 women across universities and colleges in Kerala. And the result of that was a presentation to the minister which led to this policy called Nirbhaya, on which I was very fortunate to be a part of it. And the thing about Nirbhaya is that it roped in every ministry. The minister understood that this was not a woman's problem, that the GDP, which is everybody's god at the moment, gets affected if women get back into the workforce or if women's work is recognized. And the reason of bringing everybody in was exactly this, that just the police station working wouldn't matter. So they also set up women's shelter homes. They also set up a training program for the panchayats to become more women friendly. They 
encouraged villagers to come and report any kind of exploitation of women, beating of girl children, trafficking of women to the panchayat, and they created an entire line where people could go and tell others who would take action. So that is the Kerala model. On the media, the only kind of woman that we offer up to the young girl, young men, is a bimbo. And if this is how we are treating women in advertisements, in television, in Bollywood, uh, the only women we show as being successful are women who are jutting their breasts out or whatever. And this is, this, is, this is what young girls aspire to be. And one of the most frightening things, Jasmine, you haven't seen this, is to see three-year-olds dressed up like the most vulgar female figures in Bollywood and pouting and doing this without understanding the repercussions of what this is doing. And you are telling boys that this is okay to actually pick them up, use them and throw them away is fine. Your government your ministers, your MLAs, your chief of police, your judges are telling girls that you are provoking men and therefore dress better. You are wearing jeans and therefore men are raping you. There are ministers who are saying that 90% of women who are raped enjoy the sex. I mean, the pro 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 problem, the fact that so few business leaders are here, it's just a non-issue for them. Malika, very well said, very well said. And I think that's exactly what we want to move in. But the other side is that the business leaders who are here are very, very committed and they're partners and allies in this cause. But I think, Malika, we will have to take this, and I hope this is not the first time that WEF will do it, because what you have said, I think, strikes a chord in anybody who thinks about it and any, anybody who knows what's really happening. Let me move from what... Malika has raised and is doing to a live example, something which is very, very serious and something which is just across our border. I was in Nepal in 1993 when I heard about the founding of an institution called Maiti Nepal. And we're very fortunate today to have Anuradha Koirala, who is the founder of Maiti Nepal. What I would like to ask you, Anuradha Ji, is if you would share with us how you started this, how you improved or enhanced the awareness, how you dealt with the issue of trafficking, and what results you have seen, and basically what one person can do to make a difference. Anuradhaji. Thank you. Uh, when I first started uh, in 1990, this problem existed, the trafficking of women and children existed before, uh, since 1926. But nobody spoke about it because the system was such, the political system was such. And when in the 90s we got, had uh, we established uh, uh, democracy, then people started talking about it. But they were all talking in a uh, big hotel, in a five-star hotel, in a ro closed room. But the problem was not existing there. They were all saying the problem was in the villages. But nobody wanted to go there. So what I first did was I just collected few people. I thought like always we make programs for women and uh, child, children and women, but the youth were always missing. So I targeted the university children, media people, because media was always writing what was only said in the city. I really wanted them to see what the village is and what the problems are. And then I took the uh, judges and the lawyers with my group and the police because uh, uh, police had to go because uh, I, I, uh, they were the ones who could uh, take the cases and not take the cases, so I wanted the police to come also. So we made a big group and, uh, of two, 210 people, and uh, there were eight districts which were most uh, vulnerable to trafficking. So uh, we went from uh, village to village, uh, talking to people about trafficking. The whole day we would talk to the people on the field because they would be in the field. And, but we made a point that in the evening they came to the village school and uh, we had the police band with us and we played the police band with a very uh, uh, our folk songs and the people would gather and we did not know nobody knew if there was a trafficker there if a mother was there if the fa parents were there or the girl was pray so we had message for everybody so we started uh, spreading message for to the people there the lawyers would tell them about the trafficking laws and uh, the police would tell them how to report 
and uh, a, a girl from the university pretended to be a traffic survivor and she would tell about the trafficking and the doctors would tell them about HIV AIDS. But uh, the impact about this uh, whole uh, tour which we made on the eight districts was that uh, the police, uh, uh, it was reported that 150,000 Nepali girls were in India. But when we saw the report in the police list, there was only 1,600 missing. So nobody went to report to the police. So now, as you know, as Malika also very nicely said, I think, uh, if you go to the police, it's very obvious. Uh, Honorable Minister also, I think, would agree to this. Uh, uh, it's very obvious that if you go to the police in this region, and report as a parent, if I go and report and say my daughter is missing, they will definitely say, oh, she must have eloped with someone, or she must have gone with someone. Don't bother about it, because she is a girl. She is discriminated there. If a boy was lost, a boy would be, they would have made a big search for them. So then after we went to the villages, now the parents started reporting to Maithi Nepal, not to the police. Though we are not the state, they reported to us because we started now building good rapport with the police also and the government also. And uh, all the clients back in, uh, uh, all the clients are also not very bad. Some clients are very good and uh, they, when the girl cries, they ask the girl the address and they write to their parents and say, please go, your daughter is in so-and-so place, please go and uh, report to Mighty Nepal. So they come to us and uh, with the address. So we have our partner organization in India and now also in Middle East and also uh, across the border we're having problem with China also. So we have uh, our partner organization. So we write to them and that is how we rescue the girls. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anuradhiji. I'll come back to you in this because I think this is an inspiring example of what can happen when yes, this is, I people think, get to it. how you can change the society, I right, think. Right, and how you can change it. Uh, let me uh, bring in now Chavi. Uh, Chavi, you as a sarpanch, you are seeing it at the ground level. So please tell us what roles you think local community can play. And I think it will be good if you can also relate with what Malika raised, and the whole issue of the icon, the role models. What sort of women are sort of, you know, playing a role model for the young girls and boys? Chavi. Certainly. Um, well, I'd like to uh, touch upon the topic, not in terms of the missing women that have already been spoken about, but also in terms of um, the missing women in terms of the inability of them to contribute, especially at the grassroots level. And I'm referring more so to the elected representatives. Uh, because uh, by and large, if you really look at the women in villages, there is no education. There is no formal training about the roles they can play as an elected representative. So the concept of being a role model really is not even there because they themselves do not know how to perform their um, uh, roles. And on top of that, uh, having a family commitment, which obviously women cannot get away from, uh, having an average size of say five children per household. So they have to work in the fields more than eight hours they waste the time not having toilets in the houses. They waste a lot of time walking distances to find a place to, to defecate out in the open. They have to spend time in taking care of their children, of, um, of the families, of cooking, and then to find time out to play the role of an elected representative to develop the areas. It actually is really, really difficult, in addition to which the challenges, as we know, in rural villages in India are monumental. So I think it's very important that we incentivize these women because right now the, the women across um, the PRIs, the Panchayati Raj institutions, are disincentivized uh, given the fact that ward punches. So I'm the Sarpanch, who's the elected head of the uh, uh, Panchayat or the village council. Along with me, in my team alone, there are seven other women and four men. But these ward punches, the other elected representatives in my uh, council, they only make on an average 225 rupees per month. That's their honorarium. As a serpent, my honorarium is much higher, which is 3,000 rupees a month, but I am I'm a step away. I'm, I'm somebody who, who doesn't really fit the norm of an average serpent. I have the backing of education of my family, economically secure, but by and large, serpents are not. And to have an honorarium as little as 3,000 rupees it clearly is something that doesn't incentivize people, especially women, to come forward to take the role. Yes, we have had quota system because of which states like mine see 50% representation of women. But 
is that representation good enough if they're incapable of performing their duties? Um, I, of course, uh, like I said, being a, a step away um, from the normal norms, um, there were actually, what would be interesting to note is that there were 50 men, the older men from the village who came to me to plead that I become the serpent of the village. And um, that was primarily because within the village they had not really found anyone who could bring about any incremental change in their lives. The reason they came to me was because in the uh, late 70s, my grandfather, who was uh, a Brigadier Raghubi Singh, he, he was uh, awarded the Gallery Award Mahavir Chakra, and he, they brought him in, in the same manner, and he brought in a lot of development in the village. He stuck around for 15 years, but between him, him and me, there's been a gap of 20 years. And what of the village saw in terms of development of roads, of introduction of uh, a health center, of uh, education institutions, schools for, for, for the girls specifically, linkages of roads, so all of this happened because of him. Post which informally my family had always been around for the villagers in case they ever needed help. And I'm guessing that's the reason why they chose me. Um, and for me, it's really been no looking back. Uh, I have to admit, it is a challenge. But um, what is really, really satisfying is, is, um, is how even small differences can bring about such, um, such a huge difference to the lives of people. And my village has a population of about 10,000 people. And to be able to bring about that modest incremental change in their lives is what is most satisfying and fulfilling. What I am trying to do, and focusing more on the topic uh, specifically, is basically I'm trying to focus on the youth and the women in particular, and provide them training, focusing more on governance training. Because I believe that uh, if you want to see women be respected in, the respect in the society, there has to be a value attached to them, and people need to be able to see that. And I think by providing such training, not only will I be making life easier for them when they take up roles such as I have taken, um, and, and thereby perform activities and duties, and also be able to focus on issues related to women. What often happens is that having the kind of women who become uh, elected representatives at the grassroots level, people don't come forward. And by and large, they're men who actually work. So it's a proxy thing. So say, for example, if I were married, which I'm not, so I don't have those commitments, but if I was a regular serpent, um, normally my husband, my son, or my brother would be performing all the activities, and I would merely be just signing, more often than not, not even signing the documents that I'm supposed to sign as a serpent. And that's what normally happens with the women who get elected. But if they have the formal training, they will be able to perform. And also I have noticed in my village, out of a team of seven women, there are two women who have smaller families. They only have two kids each. And in those families, you can see that there is respect for their girl child. They are educating their girls. They are training them and giving them uh, opportunities to rise up and, and, and uh, say, for example, stand up in debates, even if it be within their own communities, they are giving them those platforms. And these women are the ones who are a little more proactive vis-a-vis -vis the other women who have larger families. So I think it's also important to realize that family planning is critical because of, as already pointed out earlier, the issues attached to the, uh, the stigmas attached to girl child and to women has to do, I mean, it's, it's, it's multi, multifold, but I think by just adding that value, one can change things, and having women be competent enough to perform their roles at this level can change the face um, and the situation that girls and women face in such areas. Thanks, Chavi. I'll come back to you after I've gone through with Rajendra, and I'll ask you about how you have seen improvements, if any, in the status of women in your village, uh, very specifically over the last 5, 10, 15 years. And I'd like to link up with something Jasmine, you had said, and I'll request Malika to reflect a bit on that when I come to you. <coughs> Jasmine mentioned, I think, a very important point. There is no silver bullet. You can't have just one. It has to be a variety. So Malika, if you could sort of think about bringing in what are the things that you could do? You have raised the issues, which I think are very, very appropriate and relevant. But what would you do about them using media? But let me first go to Rajendra. And Bring in, uh, Rajendra, your perspective as uh, chairman of a large IT group, how are you using opportunities to empower women in your organization in specifically and maybe broadly? And how can that be a model for empowering women? Because one message that we are hearing both from the minister and from uh, Chubby is this whole issue of empowerment. How are you being able to push that agenda? So I think uh, first uh, I understood the meaning of the odd man out today in this panel for the first time. 
and last three days I have been very frantically trying to talk to my wife and my two daughters to say this whole thing of missing women, I need to get a little better prepared. And um, so the joke in the home was, my son is in Bombay, I am normally not at home, so they said ours is a case of missing men. It's not missing women, but my elder daughter is a, a psychoanalyst and the younger one is uh, in LSR, aggressive young girl, so they had very interesting takes on this issue of missing women. And uh, because my earlier view was about the girl child, for example, but then the issue of girls missing from school because we don't have toilets is an example of missing women, for example. Or the fact that, uh, and this my elder daughter was a psychoanalyst, made a very strong point that the, the reinforcement of this son preference thing is actually implemented by women, though they're victims of the process, so they're actively implementing this son preference question, so it becomes that much more difficult to implement. But uh, coming to the, the, the context within which you want me to talk, which is the corporate sector, so first of all I recognize that uh, that is a very minuscule percentage, you know, 8 million people out of a billion in the corporate sector is minuscule, so I don't know how relevant the context will be, but within that I think there are a couple of interesting changes. One is that I think that the economy is becoming now a services-led economy. So more than half of GDP comes from services. Uh, and services lend themselves to being delivered by women, in my view, better than by men. Look at banking, look at finance, look at education. So there is a, a natural, I think, advantage that women have because of their emotional uh, superiority, if I can use the word, to engage with people on the other side. Our industry, which is the IT industry, uh, has almost 40% as women. And we have two companies, we have a software company, we have a, an education company. So one thing which has happened, and I think we probably did it deliberately, is that both the HR chiefs are women. They've, they joined the company 30 years ago, one of them, the other one 25 years ago did various functions and ended up in this function. And the HR function has a large number of women. So I guess there is, uh, we have perhaps in some way wanted to do that, recognizing the fact that this correction has to be done. And uh, so we find that given the fact that these sectors have very large percentage of women, we heard of, we've heard of the BPO question and the security of women and so on. So there's a heightened sensitivity to concerns about women. Uh, in, in this sector and therefore we have a lot of policies. We introduced 20 years ago a policy called paternity leave, saying that if a man is working in the company and the, the wife is going to have a kid, he better take leave and do what they're supposed to do. So many of these policies have evolved, but as I said, this is still such a minuscule percentage that how much of this will rub off into the remaining 99% is a question mark. But to the extent that in the corporate world, since the services sector is becoming predominant and more and more women are coming in, I think there's an awareness in their examples and role models. The second point which I want to touch on, perhaps larger implication, is the role of technology. And I think it's not fully leveraged, but the promise of technology to deal with some of the problems we talked about is quite enormous. Example, we have in India this uh, program called Aadhaar, the identity. So I think the missing question, uh, the first answer is identity. And um, so the attempt in India is to give each individual an identity, and not just an electronic or a physical identity, but then uh, everyone is someone. But again, I think in, the, in tracing down people in terms of missing individuals and identifying them, in this country we are beginning to now put in place a mechanism which is completely technology-based, which will at least establish identity so that in the administration of many actions of at all level, that will happen. The second is mobility and the mobile device, <coughs> which means a connection, connectivity. I think this is an extremely empowering uh, possibility. Mm. So children get lost in the good old days. Now you just tell someone, give a name, and you can pretty much go to Google, get the address, and find out. So connectivity and connection is actually a liberating force. It's a hugely liberating force. We see 
Now, hundreds of examples, hundreds of examples of women. In fact, Bangladesh is the classic story of the women taking the home, phone and going home to home to rent it for a call. But that empowerment and connection of a woman who's gone into a home with her relatives and parents and so on, so she doesn't feel she's missing in that sense. I think there's a huge opportunity of technology, uh, of connectivity. Then we look at education. I think education is increasingly becoming a process which is taking us away to experience exchange of information. So in fact, I, I don't want to belabor the, the, the science of it, but engaging human beings to experience interactions is what education should be and is becoming. So therefore, with a mobile or a handheld device sitting in the, you know, on the top of corner of Mount Everest, you could engage. So I think technology perhaps has a much greater promise to deal with this very deep-rooted attitudinal changes by making it possible for women to do things that they couldn't do, to get educated, to connect up, to communicate, to raise a hand and so on and so forth. So to me, I think more than what the corporate sector can set as example is what technology can do to help women uh, deal with this issue head on. Thanks, thanks Rajendra. Let me uh, turn to the minister now. Uh, Madam Minister, the issue of enforcement uh, is a very important one. Uh, and if you could kindly comment a bit on that, because some of the issues that panelists have raised is a question of enforcement of laws which are already there or regulations which are already there. I, I think uh, enforcement is um, the way, only way, legislation enforcement through awareness. If you are aware to the people, these are our law. And I need the social help, social activist help, society help in that. So um, it, now it's a burning issue and um, we are giving reservation in jobs. 73rd and 74th Amendment have brought political empowerment, political empowerment of women to reservation just like uh, Chavi because uh, uh, in um, Panchayati Raj we have given Earlier, we have given 33% reservation. Now, in local bodies and panchayat iras, we have already given 50% 50, 50 reservation for women. That's why compulsory they will come and um, they, uh, naturally they will impart. So, panchayat iras, local urban bodies, we are giving 50% reservation. And through Sarv Shiksha Abhiyan Right to Education Act, we hope to improve the literacy level at uh, girl child, female level. And the other empowerment of women, we are giving, just like I before said, that Sabla. Before, if Sabla scheme is there, they are coming to at the um, uh, Anganwadi centers. Bridge education is there. Their health uh, problem, we are solving their health problem, giving some hygiene uh, issues. And I believe education is very important, changing the status of women. Uh, through our skill, uh, through our skill mission, and livelihood mission, our government is making efforts for economic empowerment of women. These empowerment women, awareness through awareness through society, as, as, as I before said, this Ahinsa messenger, we are creating right. Ahinsa messenger, so they can give awareness to the poor, poor uh, lady, right. those mm -hmm. who are living in a dark street. So they can help. True, them. I think those, those are all very useful and important, and I appreciate that. But what do you do with your colleagues, Madam Minister, who make statements like they have, which Malika just referred to, and that's just one example. So what do you do about awareness in your own polity, your own colleagues? Because they, that's where people look up to, and you hear a politician, and I'm not mentioning a particular one, who makes statements like we have heard. I think that it is just wrong. completely it is destroys any credibility. I think it is very sad if they are giving such uh, type not of... Not if, but they have. Uh, not if. <laughs> they, they continue doing so. So I think the, the, you know, the issue is not here to sort of you know, just talk about the problems. But awareness... Recently I had a meeting with the look by female MPs right. and, and, and I discussed with them. Right. Maybe we all can aware of uh, just... Uh, may, I, may I say something to this? Female MPs are no better. They also have the same mindset because in India... Churiya todni ya churiya pehenni is supposed to be an insult. Wear bangles. And I have heard women MPs say to a male MP, if you can't stand up and do that, go home and put on bangles. That is the worst insult to women 
because you are saying that if you are not man enough, then go become a woman. So female MPs do it as well, so. True, but I think what Madam Minister is saying is that you've got to start somewhere, but I think I'm going to push you a bit on that. Please do start somewhere, uh, female and male MPs, because the awareness issue, which I think you're absolutely correct, has to be at all stages, uh, all, all levels of the, of the community, including the political leadership. Jasper, let me bring you in at this point. Uh, a point which Chubby and Rajendra both have added, which I think is very good, missing women, we've talked about that excess female mortality ratio, which is the typical definition. But missing women is also women who are not being able to reach their potential because of lack of facilities, uh, lack of education. What is Save the Children doing about improving the various deficiencies for women, uh, for children, girl children in, in this region? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question, but I just also wanted to pick up on a couple of things that the, the panelists have brought up. Um, I, I, the point about family planning, I couldn't agree more on. Um, and in fact, if you look at how Bangladesh has managed to um, achieve a lot for, you know, relatively, comparatively to India, a poor country, but is actually on track to meet its Millennium Development Goals on reducing child mortality. A lot of that is around, uh, is around family planning, enabling women to take charge of, of their own lives. So I, I really wanted to endorse that. And also um, another example on uh, picking up on, on your point about the use of technology. But in a way, this is a, a more positive example for India, I think. When you talked about 40% of... Um, of, of, of people in, in software engineering being women. I mean, that's a really positive thing that I think India could learn from success stories as well. I am uh, sit on the board of BT, and uh, we, I was very shocked to find that of all of our new hires, and we are hiring people, uh, only 14% are women. And when I challenged this at the board level, the answer was, oh, but that's because it's engineering, it's a technical area. Um, and so a couple of us women on the board said, well, hang on a second, India does a much better job of this. So, so I just wanted to kind of put, put that out there as well. And I, and I do think that technology can help. I think that studies have actually shown that mobile phones, I mean, this is very early days, so um, I think more work is needed to, done, meet, done to, to look into this. But studies have shown that where women do have access to mobile phones, and often they don't because of financial um, they're not in charge of the, of the finances of, of, the, of the family. But where they do, um, studies have shown that this decreases the rates of domestic violence, exactly for the reasons that you were highlighting. So I just wanted to pick up on, on those points. Point. In terms of what um, Save the Children is doing, well, um, let's pick, we work right across the spectrum, but, but let's look at education, for example, where um, both in India and around the world, it is really important to ensure that children, um, both girls and boys, have access to school and that girls are really supported in, in both entering school and in, in being able to do well in school. Um, you talked about, you know, typically it's often thought that women um, are, are, are good teachers. You were talking about that in terms of, I mean, personally, I'm not so sure there's a the massive difference at the end of the day between men and women, depending if they're given equal rights and opportunities. I think both men and women can be good teachers. In many parts of the world, there are only men, male teachers, and that actually can really hold back the, the chances of girls, of families feeling in rural areas, feel confident sending their children to school, of the girls feeling that they have a role model that they can emulate. Um, so I think education would be one area that I'd pick up on um, as, as critical that Save the Children is focusing on. Thanks very much, uh, Jasmine. Malika, you have mentioned, and so has Jasmine now, talking about the icon, the role model of women. What do you think you can do or you are doing using your medium for that role, for that purpose? You know, my father brought television to this country in 1968 right. to instantly be able to communicate with every village because he felt that that technology um, would transform India. It didn't happen. He died and it became Durdarshan. But through television, <laughs> through television, we have been working with television and we've been taking the most popular genres of television. Uh, you mentioned soaps in, uh, in Nigeria, did you, in Africa? Uh, 
there are hundreds of examples. And we in India are a country which traditionally has studied and been educated, value educated, through song and dance and theater and sculpture. And yet we don't see the writing on the wall. Whatever we've been doing for 65 years hasn't been very successful, otherwise we wouldn't be in this conference here talking about this issue. We have examples of how amazing performance, television, film can be in creating a different paradigm. What hasn't been mentioned, and I'd like to mention, is that most village women do not even see that there is an alternative to the drudgery that they're living in. And that's even more frightening, that they don't see that it's anything to do with a woman's role. They, the answer is, but that's a woman's fate. So we haven't even gone as far as showing that there is a possibility of not living a life of misery and still being a woman. And all of this can be reached very, very quickly through the media, I mean, India is film and television crazy, but we continue showing and advertising the most repressive and reprehensible roles of women continuously. We are working, and I have uh, approached the ministry about this, on specifically targeting to create a role model uh, of a series of young adolescent girls and boys that can go on television and once they've been on television can actively go into schools and colleges after they've become icons to become not only icons but real people that people can look up to, that people can write to, use Twitter, use social media so that they become accessible, they become the ones answering to others of their age group, they become the ones showing others of their age group that it can be done differently and you can still win the popularity polls. Good. At this point, uh, let me bring in the audience. Uh, I have a question for Chavi that I'd mentioned and for Anuradhaji, but I'll hold it off because maybe the audience uh, would want to add to it. So if you would, uh, if I can see you uh, against the glare of the light, uh, feel free to raise some questions. Uh, yes, please, the lady in the center there, if somebody can get her a microphone. I'll take two or three, bunch them together, and then we'll, we'll get the panel to respond. OK? Yeah, I think the change for women in this country will come from rural women. It will not probably come, and it will come from really poor women. It probably won't come from the middle class uh, who already have, uh, you know, things that they can manage uh, in ways that they want to manage, and they have certain choices that they make. Rural women don't have too many choices. So I think that's where uh, if we, as a, as a nation, focus, uh, I think we would do a lot, really, to change the way uh, women's lives. And I think this is where the, the second point is, and how is this to be done? And uh, the focus is so far uh, has been on microfinance, has been on self-help groups, has been on scaling uh, things which are at very subsistence levels. Uh, they've been at, at uh, you know, little, little, little livelihoods here and there, you know, with little bits of money that women can garner. Now, this is... This is good, it provides scale, uh, it, it covers large parts of the country. But where do we go from here? So that debate of where you go beyond this is still waiting to be discussed. It's not actually out there either in the policy way. Yes, it's in bits and pieces as in snippets. And we have somebody here who's talking about skills. But I must say, NSDC and everything, nobody's talking about it. And it won't be through the internet. It will not be necessarily through technology, it will not necessarily be through all of this, because there are large parts of tribal India, etc., uh, which will not actually be reached in this fashion. It really requires human-to-human -human interaction, and it requires people-focused skills based on local resources and livelihoods which can be taken through value chains. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here. Can I, and then gentlemen here, can I request you to actually raise a question rather than having a statement of your own? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, the lady there on the edge and the two gentlemen here, and then I'll get back to the panelists. My name is Aparajita Gogoi, and I work for a nonprofit called Setpa India, and my question is specifically around the missing women in our workforce, in our economy. And specifically, Honorable Minister, you spoke about the Sabla scheme, which promises, promises girls livelihoods, life skills, and nutrition. We have been trying to help the, make the scheme a reality. And 
we haven't been able to find vocational training agencies who would actually go into the villages and train adolescent girls. And since this is the forum of people from the corporate sector, I would like to ask you what is actually stopping us from investing in actually providing livelihood skills to girls who are living within constraints. These are girls who cannot travel to the district headquarter for training. So can we take these skills to their villages? Can we think of appropriate skills which are for the girls with restrained mobility, with not enough security for them to step outside, where we need to change mindsets? So is there any way we can look at this problem? Good. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, uh, Whenever I go to any part of India, in any village, and if I have a dialogue with women, first issue, the first ranking issue they name is issue of alcohol and alcoholic men. Whether their father, their husband, whether their sons, but this is their biggest problem. And that is one reason why women disappear from the social arena after six o'clock in the evening. They cannot come out, they are not safe. Chavi, I am sure she would, you would bear me out that in a meeting in a village, if there is a one drunk man, he can make any participation of women impossible. Now the problem is, and why I am mentioning this issue here, that alcohol is looked at as a growth issue, economic issue. Men in Maharashtra alone are drinking alcohol worth 3 trillion rupees per year. Sorry, can I just get you to get to the point? Yes, my point is, Women participation in the social and political field versus economic growth of alcohol industry. How do you reconcile? Okay, yes. Uh, and then we'll get back to the panel. Yeah. Uh, I'm on Sugar. I had uh, Amdocs, which is an IT company. I think um, one of the powerful things I heard about was from Chabi, and I want to ask this question to her. She talked about the value addition. Value addition in terms of how to raise the level of a woman where men see a value, keep aside the negative connotation of the value, value from the woman. So can you share some ideas that you've got on how that can happen and what you are seeing in the village that you are leading? Good, thanks very much. So let me now take those four questions and come back to the panel. And I think Chavi, maybe you can start off and also maybe build in what I had asked you about the status of women, how you see it changing. And then I'll ask Rajendra to talk a bit about the use of technology. And Madam Minister, if you could talk a bit about the question Sabla. here about Sabla. Sabla and self-help yeah. groups. Okay, please. Um, multiple points here that I'd like to address. Uh, first and foremost, I believe, yes, the larger population in India continues to remain in rural India, and therefore we need to. It's about time we woke up. It's been so many years and we haven't done enough. And I feel, first and foremost, we need to take care of the very basics. When a human being is unable to receive his supply of safe drinking water, is unable to get a roof uh, over his head, is unable to have food be available to him on a daily basis, there are going to be frustrations. There will be points when he, he or she would want to release those. And by and large, men get frustrated. Alcoholism begins because they need a release to that frustration. And by and large, human nature, when you, when you see that release coming out, you will always suppress the weaker, and that is usually the women and the children. So unless until we do not provide for the basics, that issue will continue to remain in our country for the longest time ever, and I think that needs to be addressed in a big way. And we have multiple players, multiple stakeholders who can help in a big way, provided we learn to start thinking out of the box, realize that villages are huge opportunities, you just need to think a little differently, fine-tune a little bit, and there's huge scope in not just providing training to the people there, but also finding means to uh, a lot of different varieties of things that you can do in villages as well. Uh, going back to what Madam Minister said about the quota system, I have to disagree. Yes, we need quota. In 65 years, women have not had the kind of representation that, need, that we need. And something needs to be done, and quota perhaps is the best way forward, which we have seen in the numbers of people, women who have come forward. But that does not mean you have empowered them. Unless until we do not educate and provide the training for these women, um, including me, to figure out what the laws of the land is, how you function as an elected representative, what is it you can do if there are any hindrances, how do you f work around it? 
But if you don't have that, and by and large in villages, I'm sure most of you who know would agree, that a ten, even a tenure of five years, by the time you figure out how to work around things, by the time you figure out what schemes exist, your tenure is, it, is over. And therefore, the development which could have been vis visible is not visible. Uh, going back to, so I think that kind of addresses Mr. Abhay's uh, question. Um, secondly, uh, what Anshu asked, and as well as Mr. Nag, what you said, the value addition. In my village alone, you'd be surprised. And what is really amazing and overwhelming is the fact that you actually don't need to do very much. All you need to provide is a little bit of moral support, a little, take some time out to discuss things with people in the village, be it the men and the women. It again is very important that we also sensitize men. Because unless until you don't do that, there is no way by empowering women you will actually be able to improve the status of the women. Men have to be sensitized, and I think it also needs to begin at a very early, early stage in, in, within families when we stop compartmentalizing and, and discriminating a certain uh, job as being fit only for women or only for men. That, I think, needs to happen, which used to happen, if you look at ancient India, all of that existed. Women and men were at par, but with, with the invasions, as we know, things changed, and that has kind of sort of gotten ingrained in our system so deep that it seems difficult. We have uh, systems which are working, but it's not visible because of the higher population that exists. So there is visibility. The kind of things we have Shabhi, done in my I'll village... I'll have to ask you to now wrap up. Oh, sure. I'll wrap up with the things we have done in my village. On day one, my team, when we got elected, only men turned up for the meeting. When I asked where the women were, they said, well, we are here. And I said, please send your women, and I guaranteed them. I said, I want the women to learn to read, and if they do, are not educated, bring their uh, husband, sons, uh, daughter, whoever, to read the documents and then sign it. And just by giving them that uh, faith, uh, I think they had the confidence enough in me to let the women work with me from morning till night, even if it meant as late as 10 p.m. I had on second day one of the husbands call me up and say, hey, you guys carry on, please let my, women know, uh, my wife know not to worry because I will cook today. And that was on just yes. day two. And that's what I mean, very small things can actually uh, take you to great uh, horizons. In Bihar, I, I don't know Sorry. how many of you know. Sorry, Shabi, I'll have to now cut you off. Last uh, example, last example. Okay, In you Bihar, keep it for your wrap up. Uh, okay, sure. Rajendra, uh, 30 seconds on the issue of technology again. So I guess on skills, some experiences in the little villages of Delhi, where young girls who are otherwise not permitted, like Tughlaqabad, we're getting them trained and getting jobs in the retail sector. Now again, this is urban or rural or whatever, but the ability to take a child, give them skills, get them to become self-sufficient, very good evidence of that. Want to couple that with the fact that India is going to put broadband, broadband to every panchayat in the foreseeable future. So the pipe will be there. Then if the girls can be brought to the panchayat, then they have all the knowledge and skills which are required. That's a possibility. Evidence in metros is done now. We have to make it happen. Thank you. Madam Minister. Um, Nag ji, ye jo baat abhi unhone sabla ke baare mein batayi, main uske baare mein Hindi mein baat karna chahta hu. Sabla, ठीक है उन्होंने कहा कि sabla adolescent girls को skill education देने के लिए है. Sabla से फायदा ये हुआ कि जितने हमारे villages में जहाँ जहाँ हमने sabla शुरू किया, all over India, लाखों की संख्या में sabla निकल के आई. और हमें उन्होंने हमें उन्हें जो change किया, उनका mindset change किया और उन्होंने one to one ja ke apne ghar ke aas paas un mahilaon ko empower karne ke baare mein bataya self help group bane iske saath wo hamare ahinsa messenger ki tarah humne unhe use kiya dusra ek jo abhi bataya inhone ki i disagree with this reservation i think agar reservation nahi hota to hamara panchayati raj mein mahilaen nahi nikal ke aa sakti one time they can depend on their husbands but next time they will not depend on their husbands they will come themselves. वो अकेली आएंगी और कहेंगी कि हमने अच्छा किया है, husband की जरूरत नहीं है, हम जान गए हैं, हम कर सकते हैं। क्योंकि ये training हमारे NMWB, National Mission Empowerment of Women, वो उनको training village to village जाके training दे रहे हैं। और अभी मैंने जैसे कहा कि एक training हमने पाली में की थी राजस्थान में, उसके बाद कामरूप में किया आसाम में, झारखंड में, बहुत सारे आसाम � ये ट्रेनिंग से महिलाओं को आगे लाभ मिला है वो बाहर निकल के आए हैं दूसरा जो सेल्फ हेल्प ग्रुप बनाते हैं उनको इकोनॉमिकली एम्पावरमेंट करने के लिए अगर वो इकोनॉमिकली एम्पावरमेंट है तो सोशली और पॉलिटिकली एम्पावरमेंट ऑटोमेटिकली हो जाए 
That is a good point. Chabi, you wanted to come in for a moment to... Uh, Ma'am, I did not say that reservation is not good. What I meant is that with reservation, it's also important to empower right. women in the true sense, That's provide right. them the education. So the issue is empower reservation is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Let me go back to the audience for last round of questions, and then I'll get back to the panel. Is there a... Ah, yes, please. Hi, my name is Megha Bari. I'm a reporter with the Wall Street Journal. My question is for Mr. Pawar. Mr. Pawar, Indian IT, huge success story, one of the more progressive sectors of this country, 40% women, that's great. How many women in your sector are CEOs? Every company that I speak with, and I speak to all of them practically, at least the big ones, they push forward their HR head saying, look, we have a woman here. I think Wipro has a new female CMO, but I don't know how many others do. When are we going to see a female CEO instead of just men? So, yeah, yeah. So let me answer that. Women are smarter yeah. than men and they know there's an awful job to be a CEO. Uh, but, 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 but let me say this. Let me say this. Let me say this. It's a, it's a stereotype in your mind that the top job is the best. First of all, it's certainly a, the best pay. Let me also, so, let, let me also say okay. this. Yes, sir, let I me also say this. Floor now. Yeah, let me say this, that women uh, are also are coming into, into, the, into, into the corporate world in very small numbers, in our, in our industry very large. Finance sector, they came ahead of the IT sector and you can see a very large number of women CEOs in the, finance, in the banking sector, that's visible. I think there's data available, you can look at, uh, at this point ICICI, look at Access Bank, look at HDFC, so even in our sector, Women, have the, the average, if I were to take the average age of the men in the IT sector and the women, I would say that that will be lower because they are coming in later. You have to give them time. And I think it's going to happen. It's a matter of time. But many of the women who have chosen to get to a certain level and balance their lives because it's a fact, I think this is something which we have to confront, that women have to do more in the home or are expected to, are expected to do more in the home like rearing children, bringing them up. Fair and unfair is a different question, but that's a harsh reality. We have to confront that. And many of them are making choices. We have women who are earning more than the CEO, mind you, but they've chosen to balance work in a different way. Now, good or bad is not what I'm trying to say. This is a, this is a reality there. But if I look at the financial sector, which, which has had at least 10 or 15 years more of experience, uh, I think our sector will show a similar a level uh, coming forward. In the US, we've seen examples <coughs> already. Thanks, Rajendra. Uh, okay, I've got lots of questions now. I'll have to now guillotine in the audience participation as well. Okay, I'll take only the three hands which are up, starting with the lady there and the two hands I saw here. And I'll make a concession for you, sir, and get you included as well. Four questions from the floor. Uh, and then uh, we'll come back to the panel. Okay. Please keep them short and specific. Yeah, I'm Shweta Punja, right with the Business Today magazine. Mr. Pawar, my question is for you. Uh, yes, there are more and more women entering the workforce, but are Indian companies creating an ecosystem for women to move forward? Because we do see a lot of women falling out of the workforce after their first pregnancy or after they start a family because organizations are not geared to provide them with the right platform so that they can have the right balance in their life, like you rightly pointed out, that they have, they have responsibilities at home, yet they're also talented. So uh, are Indian companies moving towards flexible work solutions, which would really address both those issues? Okay, thank so you. Okay, no, Rajun, Sorry. later. Uh, okay, yeah, please. Hi, my name is Chandra Molly. Uh, just to take a medical analogy, you know, what we are discussing is symptoms, which is female feticide or poor representation in workforce and so on and so forth. I really wonder what is the disease uh, and are we tackling the disease? Okay. Hi, uh, myself Nibras, <coughs> Global Shape representing uh, Bangalore Hub. Um, my question is specifically related to the uh, red light areas and red street. Uh, are we doing something in India like what we are doing in Nepal uh, to save those missing uh, women from their homes? Because I believe that our sisters and mothers are not deserved to be treated like that. Thanks. Okay. And the last question here. My name is uh, Kumar. 
a uh, couple of questions. One, of course, uh, the question is, how do you find those women who want to be leaders and who really want to, you know, lead, lead, lead that change? Because we, we employ, we, we have a company, we don't find women, women to work for us. We, don't, we find it difficult to find women leaders, even as HR leaders at that point, of, at that point in India. And I think it's a big, big question. So I don't know really how to find those women who can be leaders, who want to really bring the work-life balance. You know, it's one question. I had a question for you, uh, Rajat, because you come from the Philippines, but you've got a lot of women working, and also there's really a lot of missing women, because on the other hand, you have a challenge over there of a different dimension, unlike India, where you have single moms, because there is no abortion, you know, because of, of country being Catholic. Here you've got missing women in India, because... You, do, you have abortions, and therefore those women are not born. Maybe there is uh, two different dimensions to look at. Just wanted to check with you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I knew this audience, even though it is... Sorry, no more question. I've got to bring a guillotine down, otherwise we'll not finish. I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. No, just a bit, just a bit. I think it's to be... No, no, no. I think, I think to be, to be fair, right everybody, now. everybody it's must have a right. Ordinary. It must. Everybody must have a right to speak. I think that's why we're here, and that's your opinion. And you know, I think that must be respected. You know, that's okay. That's okay. I think you are all welcome to an opinion. I think we must respect the v view that anybody can express. I don't think we should get excited beyond that. Uh, I might feel like you did, but I don't think that's the issue. Uh, let me uh, say that I know this is a very, very sensitive, very, very important issue that we're discussing it. I don't think we'll solve all of it in 90 minutes that we have got. What I will do is request the panel to take some of the questions. Some of them I don't think, quite frankly, can be or should be discussed with the time that we have. Let me take a question about what is the disease. Uh, I think I'll ask Malika to respond to that I think the disease is that we are blind to understanding that the disease is an epidemic until this country understands that it's not the GDP that matters it's not how many steel mills you make that matter what matters first and the country will never get healthy is unless you tackle the disease of what each and every person thinks of a woman I think this is what is important good good it's okay. absolutely crucial so that has to be tackled first. The government has a national rural mission. It has a this mission. It has a that mission. But not a single person from any of the many, many parties has taken up this issue, gone on national television and said, our women are being destroyed. Half of our population is being destroyed. We need to put all our thinking into what to do. Okay. Uh, there were some questions really which were more specific about HR leaders. I, again, I don't want to bring Rajendra again because I think he said his piece, but I would say that it is incumbent on the corporate leaders to find them. I don't think, you know, you'll just get women leaders and you say, okay, I'm appointing it. You've got to make that effort much more sincerely, much more diligently than you have. And it has to start at a very, very early stage when the pipeline of uh, uh, professionals that Rajendra was talking about has to be built. So it's a long drawn process, but I think the industry will have to step up to the plate. They just won't happen. And you just won't say, I've appointed my token, uh, you know, uh, HR or CEO or, or CFO. Uh, I think given the time that I don't have, I will now request the panel, 30 second sound bite, what have you taken away? And what do we do from here? Where do we go from? And I start with Malika and then go in that order. Malika, 30 seconds, sound bite. The corporate world, because it's represented most here, needs to understand that when they take women for what they are and with everything that they have, they are not doing anybody a favor except themselves. Okay. Anuradhaji. Uh, I would. Uh, I would like to request everybody present here, until and unless you think of your daughter standing in the place of the survivor who has gone through all this, if you don't take as your daughter, nothing is going to happen. As Malika said, all the, uh, the political parties have in their 
uh, agenda about uh, women and children, but nobody is doing anything. They are just talking. And I also request you, let's take each child as your own child, and you will see this world a better world. Thank you. Uh, Please. We all need to work collectively to improve the status of women in this society and break the stereotypical image of the girl child. This is right. Jasmine? I think I've seen that there's lots of solutions out there. Each one on its own won't work. All of them together will work. The real question in my mind is, is there sufficient will? Is this really recognized as the major problem that it is? Glad to see the room's filled up a bit, but I'm feeling that that's probably the key issue, is to build sufficient will to put in place at scale these solutions that we know are out there. Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, Chubby? Um, I'm just going to resonate the fact that we have to understand that it is an uncomfortable truth, but we have to wake up to it, and we have to sensitize men specifically and empower women with education and along with that the value addition i'm going to reiterate that again is extremely important because unless until we do not provide them employment opportunities there's no way we'll be empowering that one individual and if we empower them the very cliche term you'll be empowering the family and the communities as well um quick example uh, as, as mentioned earlier we it's taken me three years to find a trainer to come into my village to train the women on small uh, initiatives such as tailoring, grinding of spices, grinding of pulses, but that in itself has empowered these women. And we're now holding small exhibits and trying to find markets to sell their products. But that's, that's a simple way. That's another simple way wherein, which has been done in, in, a, in small villages in Rajasthan and especially in Bihar, where when a girl child is born, she's welcomed into the society and the family is gifted 10 saplings of fruit bearing trees. And that fruit bearing tree is what provides the asset value to the child and helps her through the education. And later on in life, she's the owner of the fruits which, which would come out of those trees. I think small initiatives like that as well, and the support from the society, from each one of us who's seat, seated here, can actually help resolve our issue. It will not happen in a day, not in two days. It is going to be a long run process, but we need to start and take it seriously. Thank you. Rajendra. I think. Uh, the recognition that this is a very, very deep-rooted issue to be addressed, I think that comes forth far more strongly. It's not for the first time, but comes forth. So from my point of view, there is work to be done immediately with people that I interact with and perhaps be far more conscious and take conscious decisions. But the other thing, for impact, I think the opportunity that a connected community with technology, with powerful devices, uh, and the empowerment that that can give, I think that's something I'm, I'm more interested to study and understand. And with broadband going to the village, the possibility that it can do to liberate women. I think there's a whole lot of opportunity there. So I'm personally more and more committed to see what's the science that can make it happen. Thank you very much. Uh, it would be uh, impossible for me and probably even foolish if I tried to capture this rich discussion in just a couple of sentences. So what I will do is echo a statement, a sentiment expressed by several, particularly by Malika, that India, I believe, is at a crossroad. India is, if the present economic growth projections were to be believed, give or take a bit, would become an economic superpower, overtake Japan even as the third largest economy, perhaps in the next 15, 20 years. But that entire growth story will come totally unhinged, I believe, if we do not deal with this whole issue of marginalizing and not fully utilizing the potential of the women. And if we don't let them be born, if we don't let them live, then obviously you're not ever going to do that. So I think the challenge that India faces and challenge that I think not only India, many countries in the world face is a very serious one, but I think all of us together just have to deal with it because that's a question of our survival as a, as a nation and as a community of people. I'd like to thank the panel for excellent uh, statements, interventions. I'd like to thank the audience for a very excited and passionate participation. My apologies if I haven't let you all participate as fully, but I can tell you that I've been fair to you because I've also guillotined the panel. But on that note, may I request a big applause for everybody, audience and the panel. <laughs> <laughs>